Uh, thanks, David. Uh, thanks to the Center for having me, and uh, thanks to to everyone uh, for uh, listening. Um, what I what I kind of want to talk about today is uh, innovation uh, and and the macroeconomy and, and the sort of crisis that we're in, and and where all of that stuff is is uh, going, and where where is the future of innovation and and kind of its bigger ramifications for business. So. So, so what is so what is happening today? You know, what is kind of the big thing that's happening today? Is it a depression? Is it a recession? What is it? So, so this is an article by a guy named Robert Samuelson. He's a, he's a very, very eminent economist, and what he says in the first sentence is, you know, what we are witnessing is is the bankruptcy of modern economics, right? So, so is it is it an, a depression or a recession? We don't know, but the economics that we've got seems to have a hard time explaining exactly what's going on today. So. I want to start by taking a step back and outlining kind of maybe a different perspective on, uh, on what's happening. And maybe we can use that different perspective to come to, to a bit of a different understanding about innovation. So what I, want to, what I want to propose is that what's going on is neither a recession nor a depression, but more like a compression. Okay, And what do I mean by that? I mean by that, in many ways, the value that that we are creating and the value that we've taught companies to create is, is inauthentic, brittle, and, and unsustainable. So it's inauthentic, right? So, so this is kind of the stuff that we thought had value yesterday. It turns out not to have value at all, right? This is bank write, write downs, a, a very clear example of sort of inauthentic value. The value that we're creating is, is brittle, right? So this is a graph of global market cap, which has kind of collapsed. Uh, and you know, we. You see it on the news, it's been talked ab about endlessly, yeah, but what the collapse is, is quite severe. And it's unsustainable, right? So, so this is a graph of, of, the, of the usage of uh, different kinds of natural resources and, and how they're kind of being depleted. And so when we put these sort of criteria of, of value creation, thin value versus thick value, right? Authentic value versus inauthentic value, we can kind of see that Many of our industries are failing to pass that test of thick value creation, right? And so we, we don't have the kind of industries today that we need to power uh, a strong economy, right? Uh, and that's on a global level. So why is that, right? Why, why is this compression happening, this gap between thick value and thin value? Why is that taking place? It kind of begs begs the question. It kind of makes you think, right? There's got to be something deeper behind this crisis. And let me outline to you what, what kind of my uh, answer to that is. And I call it kind of, you know, big word. And, and, you know, maybe too big a word. I call it a meta crisis, right? So it's kind of a crisis behind the crisis. And I'm going to outline to you quickly what I think that, that meta crisis is. And then we're going to get into some examples. So what is the meta crisis? I think the meta crisis is really simple. Right? The economy we've built kind of understates costs and it overstates benefits. And we know what those costs are. They're kind of social costs and human costs and environmental costs. And it overstates benefits in the sense that I can make a profit by selling you something that makes you tangibly worse off. That's the story of Wall Street. Right? So when we apply strategic behavior to those kinds of economics, strategic behavior says, I want to maximize my payoffs, but I'm indifferent to yours. When we apply strategic behavior to those kinds of economics, what happens is I'm better off, but you're worse off, right? And so that's kind of the definition of thin value creation, right? What we take with one hand, what we give with one hand, we take away with the other. And, and you know, if, if we go back through, through sort of history, people have seen this coming, right? So this is a quote by Adam Smith. And he saw this coming kind of hundreds of years ago, right? And so, I think our challenge is to reconceive value creation, right? So how do we do that? It, so it sounds like a big deal. It sounds like a big deal, but I think it's actually more straightforward than it seems. So how do we reconceive value creation? Well, the traditional way we think about it is innovation, right? So this is kind of a, a pyramid of four or five standard kinds of innovation. Technology innovation, process innovation, product service innovation, strategic and business model innovation, management and institutional innovation. And so can we reconceive value creation by doing these things? Can we 
make a better process to put a car engine together? Can we make a better product, a razor with six blades instead of five? Can we shift from products to services, like IBM did, right? It's kind of a business model innovation. Can we redesign the value chain, like Disney did with Disney stores? It's kind of a strategic innovation, right? Or can we think about managing the resources that are at the heart of our business more efficiently and more effectively? So profit centers, all of this stuff that happened in, in the 80s and the 90s. It's management innovation. The problem with approaching innovation this way is that all of these are ways to act strategically, right? And if we go back to what I think is really behind this crisis, it's that strategic behavior, the fact that we've only taught companies to behave in one way that is kind of behind this crisis. And so it's no coincidence that we see that many, many companies who focus on only these kinds of innovation end up here, right? And this is the kind of economy that we've got at the moment. It's kind of a zombie economy, right? It's an unresponsive economy. And even when the cash was abundant, the zombie economy never invested in tomorrow, right? They never reinvented their industries yesterday even when cash was abundant and corporate profits were at their highest, right? And I think the reason for that is because we focus on these kinds of innovation. And so I think what we need to do today, and I think many of the things that we've talked about already today, are about a new kind of innovation entirely. And so I call this, my word for this, is behavioral innovation. And uh, I don't know if it's the best word, but, but you know, it's, it's my word, we can, we can call it many different things. But I think what it is about is about reconceiving the costs and benefits that we respond to. Traditionally, we think of innovation as amplifying the costs and benefits that we provide for others, for customers, buyers, suppliers, whoever. What innovation has not been about yet is about reconceiving our costs and benefits the costs and benefits that shape our behavior. Because our behavior is a function of the costs and benefits that we see, that we live, that we breathe. And so here's a, a quick, a very quick example of, of somebody that's doing it, right? So, so this is Google's marketing principles, right? And we can see it's kind of a reconception of costs and benefits for Google. It's, it's, changing the way that Google behaves. You can see the, the, the one in blue up there, right? You're smart and your time matters, right? It's a different kind of benefit that Google is seeking. Or if we think about, uh, you know, these are, I think these are Google's network principles or code principles or something, right? It's redefining the costs and benefits that Google responds to. And what's really interesting about Google, you know, a, apart from the stuff that, 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 that Jeff was talking about, is that Google is always making principles. And these principles shape its behavior in deeply, deeply unorthodox ways. I think what's truly different about Google is that it's a company that behaves beyond strategy, right? And that's really the point that, that I want to make with this section, is that if we are always behaving strategically, I think we're going to find it very, very difficult to reconceive value creation, and we're going to end up like this guy, right? <laughs> He's the master of strategy. And unfortunately, though his company is, is a cash cow, and one of Jeff's examples was kind of the cash cow is the canary in the coal mine. Though the company is a cash cow, it is unable to grapple with the challenge of reinvention. Um, so behavioral innovation, what, what is it really about? I want to offer you five paths to behavioral innovation. And, and what's, what's kind of surprising, both surprising and gratifying to me, is that we've, we've used some of these words already today, right? And so these are my kind of five paths. Um, what, what are they about? Stewardship is about not doing this. So this is leverage ratios at the banks. The banks exploited their main resource, their, their deposits, 
until it was depleted. If you have a leverage ratio of 50 or 60 to 1, a very, very small fall in the value of your assets is going to wipe you out. Right? The stewardship is about not exploiting your resources, not exploiting your resources to the point of depletion. And an example that's closer to home is in advertising. Right? So throughout the 80s and the 90s, well into the 2000s, we saw this, this, this idea of ad creep, right? So ad time per hour globally, rising, 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 right? Exploiting resources to the point of depletion, right? And now we're in a media industry, which is kind of struggling with the challenge of reinvention in an era where consumers, people, don't want ads. And they certainly don't want ads uh, clocking in at, at 20 minutes an hour. We haven't been, especially whether it's in media or finance, we haven't been good stewards of our resources. Um, trusteeship. What is, what is trusteeship about? Trusteeship is, uh, let me give you an interesting example of trusteeship. This is a, a graph of credit ratings. Okay? And what happened in the ratings industry, and what the graph is, it, the, the yellow stuff, the, the, the lines in yellow are, when the industry was in a state of high competition. Uh, the stuff in blue is when the industry was in a state of low competition. What we see is that more competition fueled ratings inflation. Okay? So the more competition there was in the industry, uh, the more inaccurate ratings got. Right? And so we have a perverse outcome. Right? More competition destroying quality. Right? And so trusteeship is about not letting that happen, right? Not engaging, not, not playing the game of racing to the bottom. Um, I'll give you another example of, of trusteeship that, that I kind of like. So it's the Millennium Dome in, in, in London where I live, and a couple of years ago, the, 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 the naming rights were bought by a mobile uh, phone network. So now whenever you want to go to the Millennium Dome, you have to say that you have to say the name of this mobile company. Hey, let's meet at the so-and-so stadium. Right? It's a manipulate. Right? It's a race to the bottom. Right? Why should I say the name of this company if this company cannot compete on a level playing field? Why are they trying to tilt the playing field? So trusteeship is about the good. Competing on a level playing field and always working to compete on a level playing field. And if you think back to what Jeff was saying about Google, one of the things that makes it special is that Google works to, in many ways, not always, and very imperfectly, but it does work to level the playing field. Um, guardianship. What is guardianship about? Here's, uh, guardianship is about the common good. So here's, a, here's an interesting graph that, that may interest, uh, that may be of special interest to us in media. This is uh, social capital in the US, right? You can see it's almost halved since 19, uh, 1975, right? So what is, the, what, is the show, what is the outcome of all the media that we've created over the last 30 years? If it's not bringing people closer together, if it's not helping people trust one another and associate with one another, right? A perverse outcome. Nobody is looking out for the common good when everybody is behaving strategically. And so that's guardianship. Leadership is about challenge, right? I heard a very interesting line uh, this morning. I, I forget who was saying it, but, but feel free to jump in and remind me. Uh, somebody said, you don't, wanna, you don't wanna disrupt yourself, right? Well, the truth is, I, you know, I think you do, because if you don't, somebody else certainly is going to do it for you. So leadership is about having that willingness, right? To disrupt yourself, to cannibalize your, your own businesses, to challenge the status quo that exists within your industry or even within your company, and to kind of be a, uh, a real leader. Let me, uh, let me give you an example of where leadership isn't. This is a, this is a graph of uh, patents in, in nanotech. And uh, one of the reasons I think that, or I suggest that nanotech is, is failing in many ways to deliver on its promise is because players are playing games of building patent tickets, right? So, so they're building tons and tons of patents, assembling them into portfolios, 
Everybody's trying to negotiate with each other to do cross-licensing strategies. And the transaction costs in the industry have, have kind of reached a crippling point. Right? Nobody in this industry is taking up the challenge of leadership, right? doing things in a different way. And we can think of many, many other markets, especially in media, without, you know, without getting into sort of Larry Lessig territory where, where patents and copyrights and IP and, and these kinds of rights issues have totally destroyed and, and stifled innovation for more than a decade. Right? Here's uh, it's another interesting example of, of leadership. So this is uh, one of the things that's behind the crisis. You can see that in this, according to this graph, you know, banks and insurance companies are, are playing this, this game with each other, right? One is buying credit, one is buying credit protection, the other is selling it, right? Now it doesn't take a genius to sort of look at this and see if there comes a time when people need to unwind their trades, there's going to be a systemic breakdown, right? Because nobody can cover that much trading volume. So where was the leadership here, right? Everybody in every bank, everybody at every insurance agency had access to this kind of data. It's an industry bereft of leadership, of the ability to challenge the status quo. And I think the, the final, uh, the final path is, is something I, I heard uh, a, couple of, uh, a couple of talks ago, which was the idea of partnership. I can't, I can't remember who said it. Maybe it was a LinkedIn guy that said uh, we, we, see our, we see the people in our community as partners. I, I, I don't remember who it was. But, so, so here's an example of what partnership isn't about, right? It's the United States of obesity, right? So we have a food industry that definitely doesn't see people as partners, right? So partnership is about outcomes, right? Focusing on people's outcomes. And we kind of covered that in, in, in many of our talks today, right? We talked about kind of transforming brands to, to portfolios of services, and those portfolios of services would kind of make people better off in some way. So, what is that really about, and why is this stuff important? I think this stuff is important because it leads to new sources of advantage. So the stuff here on the right, those are yesterday's sources of advantage. And you know what, what we know for many of the companies trying to employ them is that they're paying diminishing returns. And they're not working nearly as well as they used to. And what I think that the five paths uh, of, of kind of behavioral innovation, if you like, unlock our new sources of advantage. And I'll take you through one of them. So or maybe two of them, if time permits. Um, so here's Walmart, right? So kind of the archetypal evil company of the universe. Walmart, Walmart announced, as, as I'm sure many of you know, a goal of uh, zero waste and only sus selling sustainable goods, right? So, so what happens when Walmart does that, right? Walmart used to be a business built on cost advantage, right? And so if it achieves these goals, its source of advantage changes. It's not really achieving a cost advantage anymore. That's one of the things it's doing. It's minimizing its own costs. But it's also achieving kind of a loss advantage, right? And so it's minimizing society's losses, right, in terms of waste and in terms of unsustainable goods and, 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 you know, I don't know, rainforests and biodiversity and all of this stuff that's lost. It's achieving a loss advantage. It's a, it's a cost advantage for all of us. It's a sustainable cost advantage. It's a different kind of advantage. Because a cost advantage, yesterday's notion of a cost advantage was very much focused on me, right? If I minimize my costs, I don't care what happens to you. A loss advantage is fundamentally different. Um, I think, we ha I think I have time for one more example. So let's, let's do one. So here, here's another very simple source of advantage yesterday, differentiation, right? What is differentiation really about? It's about this idea that we could create perceived value. So here's a graph of Starbucks's uh, market price, how much, how much it pays its producers. And we can see that it used to pay its producers a pretty significant premium. And over the last three years, that gap really narrowed. And I suggest that that had a lot to do with, with Starbucks's recent troubles, right? We know that Starbucks is now a business in, in fairly serious trouble. And 
Starbucks is now committed to uh, amplifying that premium once again, right? So, so making this, this gap that's narrowing widen once again. Why is it doing that? Because in the world that we're living in, perceived value is no longer a source of advantage. If I can take your value proposition apart on Google and, and Facebook, and you, you know the score. How valuable is perceived value? Starbucks has to pay this premium not to create differentiation, but to create a real difference in what it sells. To pay more to the coffee producers so they can invest in better kinds of coffee, so they can engage in their own innovation and create a product that is truly different for Starbucks, not just differentiated, that is based on the idea of authentic value, real value, not just perceived value. And that's why, if you look at what Starbucks wants to do next, Starbucks is kind of ensuring that more and more of the money that it pays goes to farmers, not middlemen, right? Because it knows the only way to create difference versus differentiation is to ensure that everybody in the value chain gets a fair share. Right? So we see this convergence of what's good uh, for everybody and what's good for the company. Um, that's, that's, the, that's my time is up there. So I'm going to stop there. Um, I hope that was, that was somewhat useful, and I'm happy to, to take any questions. Thank you.